work is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Bow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today's Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. Roland Martin Unfiltered broadcasting live from Cedar Hill, Texas, where later I will be moderating a town hall uh, with Jasmine Crockett, state representative who is seeking to become uh, the next member of Congress. We will be, uh, there'll be, uh, of course, in a couple of hours after our show. Uh, but coming up next on the Black Star Network, we continue to cover uh, the tragic white domestic terror attack in Buffalo. Uh, a woman says she called 911 and was ru- rudely treated by the 911 dispatcher who hung up on her. Wait until we show you what she told a local television station. Also, uh, Democrats are moving to establish white domestic terror offices all across the country. They're looking to pass that bill in the House. Also, uh, Representative Stacey Plaskett blast Republicans for advancing the white supremacy theory, uh, replacement theory. We'll show you exactly what she said today on the House floor. Also, uh, on today's show, we're covering election results that took place yesterday. A number of African-American candidates won their races. Uh, We'll show you exactly what happened. Some folks are also lost in Kentucky, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. And of course, as I said, the runoff here in Texas is on Tuesday. And as you see, I've already voted. Uh, Also, folks, uh, on uh, today's show, uh, a former NFL player who has been dealing uh, with massive injuries, dealing with all kinds of problems, literally is moved out of the hospital by 15 Police officers will explain to you what happened to Lacey Leonard. It is a shocking, shocking story uh, as he continues uh, to battle uh, his post-career injuries. Also on today's show, what's up with this white woman out of Virginia who literally says that her biracial son is stopped doing his chores and she's suing because of critical race theory? These white folks have lost their mind, I told y'all. Plus, Marvin Sapp stops about to talk about his new CD. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, we are live here in Cedar Hill, Texas, at Community Missionary Baptist Church, where in a couple of hours I'll be moderating a town hall uh, being uh, featuring uh, State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is running uh, for Congress. She is in a runoff against Jane Hamilton, uh, and so uh, I'll be uh, uh, moderating that town hall uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, tomorrow's show, Jane Hamilton will be on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, as you see, yes, I did vote uh, today. My parents, they actually worked the polls. I was there. Uh, you have runoff races taking place uh, in the Democratic and Republican primary. The election is on Tuesday. Early voting ends on Friday. And so we are still in the midst of a primary season. Uh, and, of course, we're also looking at what is taking place uh, across the country, a uh, number of primary races. We'll get to that in a second. But first, we want to talk about 
uh, Buffalo, uh, the continuing fallout uh, over the mass shooting of uh, the white domestic terror attack, which took place in Buffalo on Saturday. Ten people gunned down uh, in a Topps grocery store. Uh, folks, but one of the most disturbing things was took, took place when a woman called 911 uh, and was, truly, was treated rudely and they hung up on her. She called into a local tele, a television station to describe what took place in the store uh, and how she was treated. Uh, here is that particular exchange. What you saw this afternoon. I didn't really see much at all. I just heard the gunshots and just dropped down to the ground and just waited for him to stop. And he just wouldn't stop. So I tried to call 911 and I was whispering because I could hear him close by. And when I whispered on the phone to 911, the, op the dispatcher would start yelling at me saying, why are you whispering? You don't have to whisper. And I'm trying to tell her like, ma'am, he's in the store. He's shooting as an active shooter. I I'm scared for my life. And she said something crazy to me and then she hung up in my face. And I had to call my boyfriend to tell him to call 911. Hmm. Well, that is certainly unfortunate, Leticia. Um... Folks, uh, here, here's a statement from the Erie County uh, 911. So uh, here's the statement. Here's the statement. Here's the statement I'm reading right now. Erie County, uh, which runs a 911 communication center uh, through Central Public uh, Police Services, this is the statement that they actually released. Immediate action was taken, and the individual who took that call is now on administrative leave uh, pending a disciplinary uh, hearing, which should happen within a couple of weeks. Again, uh, on uh, leave, um, uh, folks, talk about uh, absolutely crazy here. Um, seriously? And so uh, when you listen to that, she said that they hung up on her? Man, talk about absolutely uh, crazy. Now, uh, here's the deal. Uh, in New York State, unlike many other places, 911 calls are not publicly released uh, without a court order. So we have not been able to actually get the actual uh, 911 call. Uh, folks, it just, man, again, just makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, we're going to talk about that in our second with our panel. Uh, this also happened. Uh, a New York correctional officer has been suspended for literally making fun of the shooting. Um, uh, what, what happened was uh, he actually uh, made this post, sent out this post, uh, Gregory C. Foster, who is a corrections officer at the Attica Correctional Facility. Uh, this is what he posted. Too soon? This should weed out some of my Facebook friends. Yeah. Yeah. They actually said that. Okay. Uh, this is a statement that came from the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Early this morning, DOCCS had been made aware of a despicable social media post by an employee of the department. The comments made by this correction officer are in violation of multiple department rules and will not be tolerated. This vile posting does not represent the morals and values of the thousands of staff members in the department. This indiv the individual responsible has been suspended without pay, and DOCCS will be seeking termination. The department has engaged the Civil Rights Task Force, which we are members of, for potential criminal prosecution. The, the department <coughs> also launched an internal investigation to identify and discipline any staff who may have engaged with the posting. Talk about absolutely crazy. My panel, A. Scott Bolden, former chair, National Bar Association, Political Action Committee, lawyer there in Washington, D.C., Robert Patillo. Uh, he is executive director of the Rainbow Push Coalition Peach Street Street Project, um, also an attorney, Monique Presley, legal analyst and host, uh, uh, of course, uh, joins us as well, crisis manager as well. All right, folks, let's just, uh, okay. I, I, I got to deal with this 911 call because... This woman says that the 911 was back here. Why are you whispering? And admonished her and hangs the phone up on her. I mean, look, I, I get you have procedures you got to go through. But man, if what that woman described actually happened, Monique, that person to be fired so quickly. I mean, that is just sickening to think that that's how they, that this woman was treated by a 911 dispatcher. Right. I mean, and we hear these stories all the time. Um, it unfortunately is not rare. 
And I am not sure um, if there's any more information that's going to come out that would justify it. But from what it looks right, like right now, she, she should not be in that job. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here, Robert, and, and, and I can only imagine this, 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 this white domestic terrorist is walking around shooting folks in the head with an AR-15. People are diving into coolers. They're hiding, trying to survive. And you call 911 and the dispatcher is going, why are you whispering? Admonishing the woman and then hangs up on her? Well, you know, it comes down to a lack of training, lack of supervision, supervision, and a lack of vetting of people who have these jobs. Uh, we see these issues far too often, particularly in areas that are predominantly African American and minority. Uh, we're uh, not just hanging up on people, uh, where dispatchers take calls and then never actually send um, emergency care to the uh, the location, letting phones ring. Uh, very often, there's a lack of supervision, a lack of training of these uh, occupations, and a person like this should have never been hired, let alone be able to uh, stay in that job. And not only should she be fired, they should look up the entire chain of command to see who was supervising her, who's tracking her call logs, who's doing her performance reviews. How many other times has this happened? We know about this particular occasion, but what other crimes has this particular dispatcher or others who work with her uh, done these sorts of things? So I, I think you have to dig deep down into the system to find out where the actual rot begins. Don't simply cut off the surface level. Dig down in there and put in some systemic reform to prevent, prevent this from happening again in the future. Scott, uh, it, you would think that a 911 dispatcher has been trained that when somebody's calling up, it's a good bet they're not talking in my tone because they might be hiding. I mean, that's that's to me, that's sort of basic. Yeah, you know, uh, 911 support is not a job where you can have a bad day. Um, pilots can't have bad days. Police officers, to be honest with you, can't have bad days. And, the, and, the, and she's whispering because there's the shooter, but she could have been whispering because a burglar was in her house. And the 911 caller, remember the young kid who was 11 right, years old in the right. park playing? I'm saying, play she's cut. whispering. She's whispering, but, but again, I'm trying to yeah. demonstrate how important these, these, these calls that come in and I want are important. The kid that got killed in Cleveland, another dangerous piece, had to do with the call, the, the 911 dispatch, not giving the police all the details, that it might be a toy gun and so forth and so on, and the police show up and shoot him within four seconds. That's the police fault, but the call, the dispatch is also responsible. They can't have bad days, and whether they were trained or not, they've got to implement their training every day, because it's the first calm voice you hear, or should hear, when you're in trouble, or you're in danger, that voice has got to comfort you, but send help right away and get the details and send the details right away. That didn't happen here. And who knows how many people uh, were killed out of that 10 because that call didn't get handled properly. Uh, indeed. Now, yet on yesterday's show, uh, we talked with uh, attorney Ben Crump uh, and uh, one of the uh, family members of one of the folks who was killed. And they said they wanted to see uh, action from President Joe Biden, from Democrats in Congress. Well, today, uh, Democrats are moving uh, to actually uh, pass a bill that would establish offices around the country to deal with domestic terrorism. Uh, that's one of the things uh, that is happening. Uh, CBC members are also very active on this front, trying to take some legislative action uh, to deal with these type of shootings. Uh, today on the floor, uh, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, of the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, did not hold back, and she did uh, she did what President Biden wouldn't do. That is, she was specific in calling out Republicans for advancing the white supremacist replacement theory uh, conspiracy that this white domestic terrorist wrote about in his manifesto. This is what she had to say on the floor of the U.S. House today. Speaker, this Sunday in the state in which I was born and raised, New York. A man drove three hours and 200 miles to terrorize members of a local black community. This man shot 13 people, 11 of which were black. This was not a random act of violence. This was domestic terrorist attack, was an act of hate ignited by replacement theory rhetoric that is fueled by white supremacists, Fox News, and indeed 
some of my Republican colleagues. This false, ignorant, race-baiting theory called the Great Replacement has been used in multiple race-based domestic terrorist acts, including the synagogue attack in Pittsburgh and the El Paso shooting attack in 2019. There are a number of my Republican colleagues who spew this vile and venomous rhetoric. The silence of Republican leadership and their ranks in condemning this rhetoric that is not just ripping our country apart, but contributing to the death of Americans that, is, that shows that they are no longer the party of Lincoln or even the party of Ronald Reagan. I yield back. Well, that's exactly how you should do it. Um, that's exactly how you should do it, Robert Patillo. Um, again, people were talking about they want to see things happen. Uh, Democrats are, are trying to move in the House uh, to establish these domestic terror offices. Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, I think we have to dive a little bit deeper into great replacement theory uh, because people, for some reason, think this is a new idea. I, I first heard this from David Duke in 1988 when they started talking about uh, birth rates in the white community. This was after Reagan passed amnesty uh, in 1986. So the, the whole uh, concept is that the white race is not reproducing at a sufficient rate, not just here in America, but also in uh, Northern Europe, uh, to replace themselves generation over generation. And because of that, they are slowly dying out as a group. This is why during the Republican convention uh, in 2020, we kept hearing them talk about Western civilization, because it goes deeper than simply America. They are fighting for what they believe to be their legacy as white people on this planet. And if you look at the numbers, in 1960, white people made up 90 percent of the U.S. population. Uh, in the year 2000, they made up uh, right around 70 percent of the United States population. Um, the last census, they make up 57 percent of the U.S. population. And originally, people thought the singularity date when white people would become a, a no longer a majority was going to be in the 2040s, and now it's projected to be about 2036, when they will drop under 50% um, of the United States population. So almost all Republican policy over the last three decades has been based upon this conceptualization of slowing down this singularity event where they will no longer be the majority. Why are they fighting so hard to repeal abortion? Well, they need white women having more babies, and they can't have them having more babies, so they're out here on birth control and uh, having abortions. Why are they trying to build a border wall? Well, because when you're having 200,000, 300,000 immigrants coming to the country every month or so, uh, it speaks of that uh, pace of them um, of them uh, being dying out in this country. Uh, why do they fight so hard against African-American rights? Why do they do mass incarceration? Well, try to keep those population numbers down in the black community. For most of our lives, all of us on this panel, black folks have been between 13 and 15 percent of the population not growing at the rate that was initially anticipated if you go back to some reports from the 1960s. So everything in Republican policy is based upon this idea. Indeed, the entire Cassia Belli of the GOP right now is in furtherance of this great replacement theory. It is not a friend's theory. Indeed, it is central to Republican Party politics and Republican Party policy. So when we talk about rooting this out, it's not simply a question of, well, let's get these racist and white supremacists and you know, the uh, these lunatics um, who go on shooting sprees and take care of them. We have to fundamentally carve it out of the American uh, body politic because it's caustic to everything that it touches because it's predicated on one singular idea, which is the survival of the white race here in America. And until we realize that and understand that and see how it dictates public policy, there's no way that we can properly address it. So, of course, we should be um, setting up these offices of domestic terrorism, but more so, each of these shootings should be taken out of the Department of Justice and put into the hands of the Department of Homeland Security. We should be investigating Charlottesville the same way we investigate al-Qaeda. We should be investing, uh, investigating Buffalo the same way we investigate ISIS, so we can find out who supplies these weapons, what chat rooms are they in, what are the commonalities, who are the deep pockets behind this? How deep does the organization go and go in and break them down the same way we would break down a terrorist organization overseas? We have to do that right here in this country. Well, part of the problem, Scott, is when you have that, which is one of the reasons why Representative Plaskett said what she said, when you have Republicans who just refuse to even say anything about it. The folks at Raw Story actually uh, questioned a couple of senators. Uh, one of them was Texas Senator John Cornyn. I I'm here in uh, my home state. Uh, and what was interesting is this is what he said, quote, I think it's tragic. I don't know if you could call it a trend or not. 
Now, this is somebody who also who was on his way uh, to a closed door intelligence briefing. Now, keep in mind, you had the white supremacist attack that took place uh, in El Paso, 2019, 23 killed, 23 injured. We saw what happened in Charlottesville. We saw what happened January 6th. Keeping, then we also, of course, uh, saw what happened in Charleston, South Carolina, at Mother right. Emanuel. We saw just what happened in Buffalo. And this is what he said. It's just a cop-out trying to blame this on. I mean, it's violence committed by either criminal people or people who are deranged. Now, this is the former chief justice of the Texas Supreme Court, former <clears throat> attorney general, now United States senator. He said... And if people want to put that in a pigeonhole or category, whether it's hate crime or whatever, it doesn't make it any less evil. Now, Senator Ron Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, this is oh, what God. he said. Um, uh, uh, he, he actually had a problem with the question itself. He said, quote, I think it's awful. I think it's grotes grotesquely uh, divisive. Okay. What it is, is the media's showing themselves for who they are, which are advocates for the radical left, and they're just trying to cover up for Biden now. Oh, who is Ron Johnson? The most recent chair of the U.S. Senate's Homeland Security Committee. This is why I keep saying, Scott, that if Democrats lose the, lose the Senate, these are the people who are going to be in control of the Senate. The pe if, they, if Democrats lose the House in November, you're going to have crazy, deranged Republicans who believe in the white supremacy view of replacement theory who are going to be in leadership in the U.S. House. That is what is at stake. Well, you're absolutely right about that, but they sound like sympathizers. And they can't see a hate crime in front of their face. And they don't want to see a hate crime in front of their face. You know, I wish I could cross-examine them on each of the cases that you just named, because what do you do when you find the racist manifestos that monitors and mimics the white supremacist manifestos, even with Trump and with those senators and even those who would support January 6th? The evidence is overwhelming. What do you do with a shooter in Baltimore who puts the N-word on the, on the length of his gun, he also has written a racist manifesto similar to white supremacists and shoots 10 black people, wounds a, or shoots at a white person and says, oh, I'm sorry, while he continues to go on his rampage. There is so much evidence that this was race-based. There is domestic terrorism, and it's domestic terrorism about for black people. Now, if they don't want to recognize that, then everything my colleague said is manifestly true, that it is all about keeping the numbers down, keeping white people in power. And while Ron Johnson and others may not be pointing guns and going on shooting rampages, they certainly sound like, when asked that question, they sound like they're conceptually sympathizing with the shooters of these race-based of, of race shootings. Why would they ever want to sound like that? It may be in their heart, but they're not pulling the trigger. That's bad. That's really bad. That ought to motivate Democrats in the White House to call them out, not, and, and not only that, but to win the races in the midterms. Oh, it, it gets better, Monique. Uh, this is also what Senator Johnson said, who is running for re-election in Wisconsin. Quote, we see gangs. We see cyber threats. I mean, I think there's actually more threatening threats. I mean... There's more serious threats facing the nation than what's posed by white supremacists. Now, again, I condemn it, obviously. I, I guess he forgot the FBI director saying the most uh, dangerous threat in America is white domestic terrorism. Oh, but then, of course, Ron Johnson had to go to the white Republican go-to crime in Chicago. He says, quote, now I'd be concerned about that. Again, a black-on-black -black crime in Chicago. Now, I'd be concerned about that. Again, I'm concerned about all violence. But, I mean, I would focus my attention on where the murders are actually occurring, as if we didn't see murders in Buffalo. This is what he said. And I'll be focusing my attention on what can, be we, what can we do to start preventing overdose deaths. Then, of course, there is the senior senator 
from Indiana, where this his raw story uh, st st says it, that there are more than 15 white supremacist hate groups being tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center in Indiana. Well, this is what good old boy Todd Young, Republican, had to say, Monique. Oh, gosh, I'll tell you what's on most Hoosiers' minds is inflation, border security, war in Europe. I think the president and our national Democratic leaders will be well served by finding some solutions to our most pressing challenges. Now, he, these no, he, are the Republicans. He's, he's right. Who, who he's will right. be in, go ahead. He's, he's correct. That is what's on Hoosier's minds. He, know, he knows his constituency, and they don't give a damn about us. They, well, no, they well, I, hold up. Um, That's on white Hoosier's minds. I would think the, there are some the black folks in Indiana who probably care about the issue. Right. I mean, and we don't know how many black folks are actually part of his constituency um, and, and are voting for him and are responsible for keeping him in office. But, but money, money. Uh, but the he's a U.S. Money, money. He's a U.S. Money, money, money. He's a U.S. senator. All black people in Indiana are constituents of this guy. Oh, I Now, he may not care about them, saying. but they are constituents. I'm talking about who he's serving, who he cares mm -hmm. about, who he speaks for, who he's thinking about, and what they care about. And he spoke plainly about those issues. And they do not care about us. We are so dehumanized that when police kill us, it doesn't matter. We are so dehumanized that when the white supremacy and racism is in their faces and they cannot deny it, they'd rather compare and contrast and find issues that are more important than white supremacy. They'd rather find danger and threats that are more dangerous than what is happening to black people in the manner in which we're being targeted as citizens of this country. So when people like him tell the truth of their experience, their existence, their their work, um, and their issues. I, ju I just believe them. I take them right where they are. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And, and Roland, I, I want to talk about this what about Chicago argument that we always hear from uh, these people whenever we start talking about crime in the black community. Uh, we start talking about police brutality, white supremacy. The, the, all crime is terrible. Yes, we understand that. But there's a reason that we treat, let's say, uh, radical Islamic terrorism differently than two white guys fighting in the Chili's parking lot. It's because there's different ways that you handle and address them. These are organized events. So the same way that we go after al-Qaeda, that's the same way we have to go after white supremacy, because these are organized organizations. Do you really think an 18-year-old went out and bought all this equipment, body armor, front and back, level 3A, a tactical ballistic helmet, an AR-15 with uh, multiple magazines, that tactical training and shooting was uh, and ordered all this stuff? Most of those things you can't even order before you're 18 years old. So clearly there's organizational backing behind what he was doing. They try to play this off as simply being one lone wolf crazy person who had a bad day, quote unquote. No, they, we need to find out and use all the tools in the, in the uh, hands of the Department of Homeland Security to find out who he co-conspired with, who helped him write that 180-page manifesto, uh, what chat rooms was he in, what organizations was he part of. Find out where the rot begins. Don't simply take this at surface level. In the same way that we treat uh, terrorism differently than we treat white on white crime, that's why we treat white supremacy and white domestic terrorism different than black on black crime because the solution to both is different therefore you have to treat them differently so every time they do this what about ism i just simply say well then why exactly did we even have a war on terror all murder is bad murder so why should we even fight uh, terrorism overseas when you still have white on white crime here at home until we can take care of all white on white crime then we should not be addressing radical islamic terrorism or anything else but the fact is they're simply using a canard in order to try to distract people from the fact that they know a big chunk of their constituency agrees with that shooter and that's why they never want to address it nor do they believe in racism. Well, and this is all. You sound surprised somehow. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. They, 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 they don't think this exists. That. White people are afraid of the race question, racism, or that being the basis for anything in America, including critical race theory that they don't want taught in the school. So I'm not surprised at that. They should be better, but they've never been victimized by racism. They don't even believe in racism. They take point by point until you get a George Floyd where they have no choice but to say that was police misconduct.
Well, uh, let me remind people, sen in Wisconsin, Senator Ron Johnson uh, is running for re-election. You know what you should be doing? Booting his behind yep. out of office. All right, folks. <coughs> Got to go to a break. We come back uh, more uh, of today's news as we're broadcasting here from uh, Cedar Hill, Texas, uh, where in about 90 minutes I'll be hosting uh, a town hall with Texas State Representative Jasmine Proctor, who is uh, in a re-elect, excuse me, in a runoff battle uh, to replace uh, longtime Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson uh, here uh, in Texas. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. Summertime when the living is easy, or is it? Summer vacations, class reunions, kids in summer camp, all fun, but stressful. You need to get into a summer mindset and have a plan. Oh yes, our panel gives us their favorite summer planning hacks. On a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here at Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat the black tape with me dr greg carr here on the black star network every week we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in join the conversation only on the black star network hi i'm Teresa griffin hi my name is latoya luckett and you're watching roland martin unfiltered <laughs> All right, folks, uh, as I said, I'm here uh, in Texas where there are a well, the runoff elections uh, from the uh, primary uh, taking place on Tuesday. Last night across the country, uh, there were primaries uh, in a number of states, uh, of course, uh, Kentucky, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Nebraska as well, Idaho, Oregon, all across uh, the country. Uh, in North Carolina, former uh, Supreme Court Justice Sherry Beasley, African-American woman, she won the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate. Uh, she is going to face off against Republican nominee Ted Budd, who beat uh, the former governor uh, by 30 points uh, for that. There'll be, of course, Budd has been already been endorsed uh, by Donald Trump. Uh, and so that is going to be uh, a critical race that we're looking at. Uh, it's going to be a tight race. Uh, bottom line is Beasley can win, but it's going to take uh, a significant turnout, especially when it comes to rural North Carolina. Uh, May 24th, uh, of course, that's uh, six days from now, uh, Beasley will be on. Roland Martin Unfiltered will be talking about her race. Uh, in, uh, now, also, uh, there in North Carolina, uh, Don Davis beat Erica Smith. Uh, for one of the congressional seats there. Uh, of course, we had Erica Smith uh, on the show. Uh, he was endorsed by uh, retiring Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Uh, and so uh, he goes on. Remember, Republicans changed that district. It is not a solid Democrat district, uh, but it's also going to be a tough race uh, as well. Uh, in uh, Kentucky, Charles Booker, remember he ran against a couple of years ago against Mitch McConnell? Well, he's back. Uh, he won a Democratic nomination. He is going to be facing uh, Senator Rand Paul in Kentucky. Here's the deal, folks. Only 20 percent, only 20.7 percent of all Kentucky residents voted in the primary. Don't think Booker uh, uh, can't beat Paul. It's about driving the ground game. That's going to be critical uh, in that race as well. Let's go to Pennsylvania, where Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman won the Democratic nomination over Congressman, uh, Congressman Connor Lamb and also Pennsylvania State Representative uh, Malcolm Kenyatta. 
Of course, uh, uh, Fetterman, uh, remember, uh, suffered a stroke on Friday, also had a pacemaker installed as well. Uh, and so he does not know who is he going to be facing because it is an extremely tight race on the Democratic side uh, where uh, Dr. Mehmet Oz uh, is uh, slightly leading, slightly leading in that race. And so uh, we'll see exactly uh, what's going to happen there. Uh, but uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Austin Davis won the Democratic nomination for lieutenant governor. He's a brother. Uh, he is going to be running on the ticket with Josh Shapiro, the Democratic candidate for governor, uh, who he also endorsed Davis in early January. If successful, Davis would become the Pennsylvania's uh, first black lieutenant governor if he won in the fall. Now, uh, folks, y'all need, need to pull this photo up. I don't know why we don't, we don't have it here. Um, there was a congressional race, the Pennsylvania 12th, and everybody was paying attention to and that is, uh, you had uh, this young sister. Uh, she's a state representative. Her name is Summer Lee. Uh, and folks, APEC dropped $3.3 million. There are various, uh, various uh, political action committees to stop her from winning. Well, guess what? It didn't work. It failed. Summer Lee uh, has won that, that Democratic nomination by about 400 votes. Uh, she is a progressive. She was supported uh, by uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, and again, she was she worked the ground. Uh, she had a very, very uh, strong, uh, strong message. Uh, and in a second, we're going to play uh, exactly uh, her speech uh, from last night uh, where she addressed her supporters, folks, uh, to the control. Y'all should uh, look up. I uh, just, just posted it. Uh, and again, this is uh, an important race because this is what folks were told. In fact, not just this race, uh, you had a moderate Republican who was in or Oregon. He got blown out by a progressive challenger. You saw in North Carolina, progressive district attorneys, they still were able to win. And in fact, uh, Mondale Robinson uh, is a brother uh, who uh, worked with, uh, uh, of course, uh, Black Men a Voting Initiative. Uh, he actually um, hit me up. Um, he sent me a text. Just give me one second, y'all. Let me find it. So Mondale Robinson ran for mayor uh, in Enfield, North Carolina, uh, a rural town there. He was running against an incumbent. He ran as a strong progressive. This is what he tweeted me a couple of hours ago. I did it. I defeated an incumbent by 50 percentage points and got 76 percent of the vote. I outperformed everyone on the ballot. No candidate running for any office in North Carolina outperformed me with infield voters. He said, I'm telling the world that you can be as progressive in the rural black South as you can anywhere. And it's a better way to turn out low propensity, sporadic voters. Um, in some of the other states as well, uh, we saw uh, the exact same thing. Bottom line here, uh, Robert, uh, all of the folks who have been saying that, look, progressives, look, you got to run different. Uh, we, we, we have seen where folks actually are winning. Now, yeah, now you have, of course, moderate still winning. And yes, this is the primary. But the reality is this here. If you look at that race, Summer Lee is a perfect example. That sister, they put the work on the ground. They didn't sit here and bombard the airways with television ads. You can only buy so much TV and folks just start tuning it out. I'm telling you, what these candidates should be doing is telling, I'm in the church, I ain't going to cuss, but they should be telling these Democratic strategists to go to hell by always trying to put money in television. If you put money on the ground and turn people out and reach the low propensity voters who align with your values, you can beat these Republicans in November. You're absolutely right, Roland. I think that this is the problem that we've had with the DCCC, with the Democratic National Committee. They still want to be kingmakers. They still want to have the power behind the curtain. They still want to be able to tell people who the candidates are going to be. Back in 2009, I was running the attorney general's race here in Georgia for Ken Hodges. Uh, shout out to everybody on the campaign who's now old now. But um, from the attorney general's spot, we did a 159-county grassroots strategy, knocking on doors all the way down in Oglethorpe, up in Hart County all around the places where they tell you the Democrats aren't supposed to be out knocking on doors and uh, looking for voters. We got more votes from the attorney general spot than the lieutenant governor or the governor got during that primary. So the grassroots work works. 
what it takes is people willing to actually hire local strategists. Quit flying in people from D.C. and New York and L.A. to run your campaign in Lowndes County, Alabama. Get people who know the grassroots, know the ground. And this idea that progressives can't win is a pernicious lie that's been created by the kingmakers and the, uh, the party politics. President Trump blew all that up. He blew up the entire concept of having to run to the middle, of having to be this um, kind of new, neutral candidate that can appeal to both sides. We are in a tribalistic um, campaign season right now. You see the, the campaign right there in Pennsylvania, where you had three candidates running. One was running as being crazy, one was running being crazy as hell, and then one was running being crazy as all hell. They are not trying to get moderate votes in the middle. So when you're running as, uh, as a progressive, you have to run on that agenda. They got 81 million votes in 2020, make the promises, bring them through on the local level, and that's how you win, not by being this kind of blank canvas, white guy with brown hair smiling in a cornfield with a dog uh, that campaigns used to be. You have to actually have motivate voters and get out there, bring them to the polls, get them motivated, and tell them exactly why they need to vote for you, and you can win if you do so. You know, th th this this is the thing that, that, that as I'm looking at here, um, um, Monique, again, here we are six months out. Uh, and, and the reality in a lot of these campaigns, uh, what you often see is you see uh, this intense focus on, again, television ads and, and oh, uh, let's appeal to the independent voters. Bottom line is this here. You go after the people who you likely can get out. When I was in Kansas City last week, they were talking about how their goal uh, is to get 40,000 people, is to get 40,000 people um, uh, focused, uh, and that is uh, to, uh, to, to try to get local control of their police department. And again, that's just old school politics, is looking at the numbers, is studying the precincts, is looking at where the turnout was, where's the best turnout, who are your likely voters, and, and it happens every year. And look, I, yeah, you can call me being selfish. It also means putting the money in black newspapers, in Latino newspapers, uh, utilizing uh, grassroots organizations. When you have these strategists who, frankly, you know what? They really don't care if they win or lose because they're going to keep getting their checks. Bottom line is this here. You've got to put the money on the ground to turn your voters out. And I really hope, I really hope, uh, some Democrats who are running are looking at what Summer Lee did and say, how did you beat back $3.3 million of APEC money flooding into that particular district? I mean, and I think that's why organizations like Black Voters Matter are so successful and why people who have any sense of supporting them and supporting their endeavors as they're running these campaigns. Um, um, those of us who have been around campaigns for a long time, like Robert, like me, like Scott, we know that the ground game really is the only game. Uh, and so while there is, as Latasha Brown always says, you can't out-organize voter suppression, there are still methods and mechanisms that you can use to win in a fair fight. And that's what we saw happen. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Rowan, um, um, again... Uh, again, as I, as I look at I look at a lot of these races, and again, I, I spent a lot of time last night. I spent time last night just uh, looking at a lot of local races, looking at uh, looking at uh, DA races, looking at some state representative races, and the races where where you have these strong progressive voices, they were outgunned, they were outspent, they were outraised, but they were not out hustled. Yeah, but that's true, and. Um... It's all about the ground game. It's all about get out the vote. You know, Mary Barry used to say uh, to me when I represented him before he passed on uh, with the aim we got his wings, he used to say it's called political science. There's a science to politics. There's a science to campaigning. And everything you said about the ground game and getting in black newspapers and human uh, touch and, and touching voters and counting those voters. He used to put, he used to have these cards. Whoever he knocked on the door or his people knocked on the door, they got their name, address, were they a super voter or not, and he kept those cards. By the time his campaign came around, he knew how many votes he needed to win. He knew where those votes were going to come from. And on Election Day, it was about implementation. Did you have the money for buses? And each bus leader on, on his campaign had those cards that they have taken in interviewing super voters and, and general voters across the city 
across the District of Columbia. And so by the time Election Day came, he was counting votes, and when they would turn in those cards, he would know or have a good idea how many votes he got out of Ward 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He would know that already. And so he would go into election night after the polls closed with a really good idea of where he'd gotten his votes from, what the number was, and then whether he was going to win or not. That's political science, and that's what you're talking about. And, Roland, on, on that same point, well, and, just and, a little... And here's what's, what's crazy, uh, Monique. You can actually see who voted and who didn't. I mean, you, you can yeah. literally... You can mm-hmm. literally go... You can put... They will have the data... And it says, these are the registered voters, these are people who actually voted in this precinct. And so, if you've got a precinct of 800 voters and 60 voted in the last election, I'm just saying, that's what knocking on those doors, that's what touching them, that's what going to them. And again, we see Sherry Beasley, again, who was the U.S. Senate candidate, she lost, she lost as the Chief Justice of North Carolina Supreme Court by 400 votes. That's statewide in North Carolina. She lost by 400 votes. Look, this race, the Senate race, uh, I think it's now down, I think uh, Oz's lead is down to 1,500 or 1,400, uh, is actually going down. Summer Lee won her race by, by, by around 400 or 500 votes. Every vote matters, but in, in, in this, this insane idea because we saw this in Georgia, and I want Robert to speak to this after Monique, where, look, there was no more TV time to buy. There was no more TV time. They were sitting on millions of dollars of the Ossoff and Warnock campaign, and the Dem- Democratic strategists were thinking, let's just buy more radio and more TV. It's like, yo, you're, you, you, you're not going to all, you're not going to just win by blanketing the airwaves. You've got to touch the people. And I say if, if Democrats want to hold to the House and hold the Senate, they better be going and find those low propensity, high turnout voters that Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign have been talking about consistently over the last several years. Monique, then Robert. Right. I mean, there's no mystery to it. As you pointed out, we know exactly who they are. We know where they are. We know what the voting patterns are. All that information is available for what you need in order to have a successful ground game as foot soldiers. And that's where what we're always saying on the show actually comes in. Every single person can participate. Every single person does matter, not just with your vote, but with your willingness to volunteer to get out the vote. And there is something that everyone can do. I've said before on this show, I'll say again, I was probably 10, 11. First campaign I was associated with was for Governor Ann Richards. I've been hooked ever since, but I was walking door to door. I was sticking, asking people permission to put signs in their yards. That stuff still matters. It still matters. And people still appreciate who would not have voted this time around will appreciate somebody asking them, can I talk to you about what would make a difference in your vote? Are you planning on voting in this election? What are your issues in vote for this election? I would like to have your vote. Here's what I plan to do. What can I do better? I mean, that's that's person to person. If you're in it to serve somebody, then you ought to actually care about the people you're trying to serve. And and Monique's absolutely uh, right. And you know, Robert, uh, Robert, you know, Robert, you know, Robert, Robert, uh, Robert I, uh, I want you to comment, but on that point, Monique made when about yard signs. I mean, it's crazy how all of these newfangled candidate campaigns, oh, that's old politics. We've now got our uh, phones and we've got our iPad, our algorithm. In 2016, voters in Michigan and Pennsylvania were calling Hillary Clinton's offices going, where are the yard signs? We're driving all around and all we're seeing are Trump signs. And, and, and literally the Clinton campaign was like, oh, oh, that's old politics. We don't need that. And they were like, no. It, seeing yard signs builds momentum, gives you a feeling that things are building. And so all of these, are, and I'm telling, look, look, y'all, y'all know I'm a techie, okay? Again, I got two phones, three iPads, an Apple computer, but at the end of the day, politics is still basic. I need to get one more vote than you. You better use right. every advantage you can, whether that's technical, with digital, Yard signs, flyers, I don't care, pigeons, take your pick. Everything that you can use, that's what you better use. 
And, and look, Roland, uh, this, a lot of this comes out of the DNC campaign school from, that started right after the Obama campaign. So I, I always go to those DNC campaign schools, and they let the nerds take over. And just as you said, the, the particularly younger candidates, and this is a segment I'm going to call Free Game with Attorney Robert Petillo, uh, you cannot win a campaign on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook ads, so on and so forth. That's a part of it. That is a tool. That is not the totality of the right. tool. Right, right. You're not going to... You're not going to win elections going to cocktail parties and fundraisers and meet and greets. You're going to have to go to those old folks' homes and the senior high-rises. You're going to have to go not door-to-door -door yep, yep. counties you don't want to go to. You're going to have to actually wear your shoes down to the point you have to get a new pair because you put a hole in them. You actually have to have a ground team that can go door-to-door -door because particularly in uh, uh, local and municipal races, you can actually have the names and phone numbers of every single vote that you need to win before election day, and then on election day, you can just simply call through those lists to make sure that your voters are turning out on election day to vote for you. Let's say you're in a district where you need 1,500 votes to win. You can call 1,500 people with a team of five folks in one day to get them out to the polls. So put the actual work in. Quit trying to outsource it. Quit trying to use vote builder and algorithms and think you're going to outsmart the system. It's still going to come down to who works the hardest, and that's what it takes to win. And Roland, real quick. Well, you know, Scott, you know, you know, you know, you know Scott, one of the things that, you know, Scott, one of the, th Scott, one second, Scott, one second. Uh, one of the things that, that Robert just laid out there, again, uh, about getting back to basics, when you talk about uh, that, 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 that old shoe leather, again, what Reverend Barber has consistently talked about is that there are people, low, low income, poor workers, they actually represent more than 90 million voters. He said, if Democrats literally, literally turned out, bumped, uh, bumped that number by 5%, they win. But you've got to be willing to actually talk to those voters. And that's why, hey, I'm tired, all these Democrats, you know, the ones who were whining and complaining, oh my God, we didn't win because defund the police. Well, there were actually some people who won in purple districts uh, who, who still won because of that, in spite of that. The bottom line is this here. What are you saying to voters? And you know what? It's a whole bunch of lazy politicians who get outworked, okay? And they're used to just doing the minimum. And so they should be studying a Cory Bush, a AOC, studying Ayanna Presley, studying these newer members to say, Hey, how are you putting the new with the old? The people who whine, oh my God, I, I lost my position, it's likely they got outworked. Yeah, you still gotta hit you still gotta hit the ground. Those yard signs, what's important about those yard signs is the more yard signs you see, people believe that you're gonna win. And why do they believe that? Because if you're a voter and you're willing to put a yard sign and tell the world that you're voting for Hillary Clinton or voting for Cory Bush, people are going to believe you. And if they're in their neighborhood, they're going to believe you. And then you're really to go public. You're going to tell the world who you're going to vote for. That's just powerful. But you got to go get those other voters. If you're down in the poll, because most polls will poll super voters, right? That's voters that vote in every race. That's people on this, on this uh, show right now. But there are a lot of people who aren't touched because they can't talk about the issue. You go touch them. You listen to them. You get a commitment for their vote. This might be the first time. That 90 million Reverend Barber we're talking about, that might be the first time a candidate or somebody in the campaign knocked on their door, registered them to vote, and listened to what the issues are they're facing, whether you're in rural Georgia or rural North Carolina or the suburbs of Chicago. It may be the first time because they're not super voters. you got to go get them. There's a big-ass pool of voters, as you said, that have never voted or don't vote all the time, and ain't nobody asked them to vote. Go get them. You ain't got to have 50-50 in the Senate. Just go get them. But that take work and commitment, uh, Roland. That take work and commitment, boy. You got to have volunteers. You got to blanket that junk. And you know what? You're right. A lot of politicians well, don't have the I, 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 I all the money to I, do I, it, I also, but they don't have the commitment. I, I, and then look, I also don't buy, I saw this um, piece earlier today by Jake Sherman. He's like, oh, the Democrats are getting destroyed across the country. And I'm going, um, what election were you watching last night? 
See, <laughs> one of the things that happens, Monique, this becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, because I've literally seen where Democrats have picked up seats that were actually red seats. This is real simple. If you all these people in D.C. who keep saying, oh, they're going to lose, going to lose, y'all ain't on the ground. Y'all aren't going to these places. You know this. You've been out there with Cliff and Latasha and Black Voters Matter. Well, they have been going to these small towns with food and other different things, talking to people. Look, Joe Madison says it all the time. You got to put it where the ghost can get it. You ain't going to win nothing sitting your behind at home. You are going to have to go out there and get them. And I'm telling you right now, I do not accept this worldview that, oh, my goodness, it's going to be a colossal tsunami. It will be a tsunami. And yes, the numbers are there. The Republican enthusiasm is high because these MAGA people, that's how primaries actually work. It's really your hardcore people. But here's the deal. It's May 6th, it's May 18th. And if your primary is already over, you better be in hardcore general election mode. You better be having the town halls like we're about to have here uh, in, uh, in an hour. You better be doing things in your, in these cities, in these states, going after the voters, not trying to go after the mythical Republican white woman in the suburbs who you ain't going to flip. You better go after that, 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 that low income worker and speak to them about what you've done and what you are going to do. I don't believe this notion that Democrats are going to get wiped out. They will get wiped out if they don't work for people's vote. Monique, final comment before I go to break. Well, absolutely. And that's one of the things, you know, we had a president who was a, a skilled master organizer, a community organizer, and that is what is necessary to get this done. People say the reason why they don't go to certain communities is because those communities don't vote. But if you go into communities, they say we don't vote because nobody cares to come in here and talk to us. So it becomes this right. crazy circle and cycle that that the people who care about these elections have to break. I, I was talking to some people in Memphis, Tennessee last night, and they told me what their concerns were. And these were lawyers, black lawyers. And they said, we're concerned about low turnout in our primaries. We're concerned about our at-risk neighborhoods. And we want vehicles to be able to increase turnout, early turnout for our voters there, and for them to know that it matters that they vote. So these candidates... That's what they have to do. And it's not as scary as you think. You ain't got to wander off into the Bronx by yourself. The goal of organizing is to turn leaders in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then those leaders walk you in to that community. They go door to door with you. You have to get somebody to give you an okay in that area. When I first started going to door to door, I was going from 50 to 55th Street. I knew everybody by name. That's why that was my neighborhood. And that's the way that it has to keep happening. We need to get workers in our communities. And that means that somebody who's in high places has to see the necessity of the common touch. Uh, before I go to break, I will say this here. Uh, President Obama was good at him getting votes. He was awful when it came to his party. Now, I mean, I, I, I understand and, your point. Well, that, that but, wasn't the job. Uh, I was talking trust about and, and people it, being skilled Roland. organizers. No, I, 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 actually, actually, it was, actually it was the job, but uh, his DNC uh, was awful. But, oh, uh, Roland, Listen, the his DNC was, they was awful. Roland, just one point on, on what Monique No, I, actually, I, they could they could have replicated. No, hold up, hold up, Robert, hold up. They, hold up, Robert. They could have replicated I know you're about to if talk about they the didn't money. strip Good everything luck. out of the DNC and go to and go to Good no luck. no no it wasn't the money they stripped everything out of DNC and sent to Obama for America OFA OFA was one of the biggest mistakes uh, that and, 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 and individuals who were in his administration even told me that that was a big mistake but that's the past okay, Robert go ahead to final comment and I got to go to this year's votes this year's votes. Well, this, this, one, I got you, but, but no, but no, Democrats you referenced the past. Nothing. I had to go ahead and go there. Robert, go ahead. Look, just, just Robert, back go ahead. Thinking back on what Monique said, I, I tell this to people who ask me about running for office all the time, and they say, well, what about going to XYZ neighborhood, XYZ community, it's dangerous. If you're scared to go into a neighborhood, how the hell are you going to represent those people? 
So maybe you shouldn't be running if you're scared to go to certain parts of your district or you're not welcome there. So if you, if you can't go talk to those people, you can't represent them, maybe you should find another hobby to get into. Politics ain't to be cute. It's not Hollywood for ugly people. It's for servants, not for people who want to just be on TV. All right. Hey, folks, got to go to a break. Uh, we come back. We're going to talk with Lacey Leonard. Man, just what the, what the brothers, what he is going through, his wife is holding it down. But uh, just unbelievable what this former NFL player is going through when it comes to his health. Uh, we'll tell you what's the latest thing that happened. All right. It's 3,000 of y'all watching on YouTube right now. How we got 650 likes? We should have 3,000 likes by now. Every single person who's watching on YouTube, y'all need to hit the doggone like button right now. So when I come back from this break, I should see a bare minimum 1,500 likes. I really should see 2,000 likes. Well, hit the doggone like button y'all uh, on facebook do the same thing are we actually on facebook today so they were blocking us on yesterday uh and so uh if y'all on facebook hit the like hit the share button as well folks if y'all want to support what we do please we want to hit 50,000 downloads for the black star network app and so please uh download the app apple phone android phone apple tv android tv uh roku amazon fire tv xbox one samsung smart tv if you want to support us your dollars make it possible for us to travel to come places like this here to come Cover stores around the country. We plan on hitting the ground, uh, and we also expect these campaigns to spend money uh, on black on me, like they're gonna spend on these local TV stations and radio stations. But if y'all want to support us, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send checks and money orders to PO Box five seven one nine six, Washington D.C. two zero zero three seven dash zero one nine six. Cash app is dollar sign R M unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin unfiltered. Venmo is R M unfiltered. Zelle is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back here in Cedar Hill, Texas on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We welcome you to the launch of the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Assembly and Moral March on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new the compelling power that we, poor and low-income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. Oh, those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people. But together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do?
reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Hey, yo, Peace World, what's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, we've told you on numerous times, uh, we've told you numerous times uh, the, the, the trials and tribulations that former NFL player Lewis Leonard uh, has been going through when it comes to uh, his health. His wife, Lacey, uh, has also uh, uh, been with us as well. Uh, they, they recently posted some video uh, that, was, that was just shocking on, on social media on how uh, he was treated uh, literally cops moving him out of the hospital. Uh, this was the video that was posted. We saw it uh, and we reached out to both of them. Uh, they join us right now for Phoenix, uh, Lacey and Lewis. Uh, glad to have y'all back. Uh, hate to do it, have you back on these circumstances. What happened this time? Well, uh, essentially, Lewis was in the hospital. He had been in the hospital for a little over about two weeks, um, sorry, a little over two weeks. And oh, it started off, he had went in, of course, like his gout had flared up really bad and he was dealing with a lot of inflammation, a lot of pain. Um, they ended up admitting Lewis. He was there for about a week. And then last Monday, um, he had an accident uh, in the restroom of his hospital bedroom where he sat um, on, what would you say, like a metal pole? Yeah, what it, what it, what, what it was, Roland, is um, uh, one of the nurses left the uh, a sprout down that actually rinses out urinals. Um, they post a pit, they post to put them up and they actually left it down and I went in to use the restroom um, and actually sat on that metal uh, uh, sprout and um, sad to say uh, it was um, it entered my, my rear end um, and uh, from there, just a lack excessive, of excessive, excessive, excessive. I mean, you could think about the pain, but I mean, I'm talking about blood everywhere, you know, just a bad situation. And um, from then on, uh, the hospital did not um, give me any x-rays, did not give me any imaging to kind of see what was going on. Um, we asked for this for numerous days. So uh, all the way in, I, this happened on Monday the, the 9th. Um, they kicked me out the hospital on Friday, the Friday the thirteenth. Um, from Monday to Friday. Oh, wait, 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 hold up. They they threat. Wait, 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 wait. They threatened to kick you out of the hospital. No, they didn't threaten. You they kicked me out. Got injured. They kicked me so, out. Wait, wait, wait. So, you get so after you get, you after get injured, got injured because they after, they screwed up. Yeah, after I got injured, and it was negligence on the nurse on the nurse's behalf, because the nurse is supposed to pick the sprout up. Um, whenever they go to do what they got to do, they're supposed to pick it up. She, she failed to do that. Um, I got injured, and it was, I mean, I got I got pictures and videos, and it's some of the, like, the worst thing you could see when you talk about uh, uh, blood and, and, and waste. You know, it was... He was already... A, a bad well, experience. He was already... 
not even really mobile. He was in a walker, so he was already considered a fall risk. So he really probably shouldn't have been in there by himself trying to use the restroom anyways. But that's neither here nor there. When he had the injury and I expressed to them that, hey, you know, what's our plan of care at this point? Because he had already been in and was almost to recovery until that incident happened. Uh, unfortunately, they're just kind of very dismissive. You know, some of the nurses in their reports, they said, oh, well, we, it didn't interact rectally. And I'm like, well, if he, I'm sure he understands if something entered rectally. Is there any way we can get, you know, some scans done? That never happened. Um, I did ask for incident report to be written just for his records. And if something was to happen later down the line, we can make sure that he, we had some type of paper trail of what he might possibly be dealing with. Um, I was informed that an incident report was done after I requested it, but I think being that I did request it, I think the hospital was already very like, we got to get this guy out of here. And so from there, it just kind of escalated with, you know, them not giving him any type of pain medication, uh, you know, not, he was requesting doctors, doctors really not being, um, you know, communicating with him as far as like what was going on and then what led to him being uh, essentially kicked out of the hospital at four o'clock in the morning when I got the call was one of the hospital directors in Lewis um, had a conversation and this particular director had informed Lewis, you know, basically you you violated a behavioral contract, so we're kicking you out. Lewis had not signed no behavioral contract. Lewis had not gotten no type of altercation with nobody at that hospital. Lewis was not aggressive. Lewis could barely walk. He couldn't walk at all. I mean, he's in there in a walker. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, they essentially told him, you have to leave. And when Lewis was saying, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. I can't even move. They, they, that's when they threatened with the police. And Lewis was like, OK, well, you're going to have to do what you have to do. But I can't even move. And I guess they call Phoenix PD. And Phoenix PD came deep, as you can see in the videos, which I've never experienced anything like that in my life. I was terrified because by default, Lewis is 6'5", over 400 pounds. He's, he looks aggressive. America, by America's standards, he's an oversized black male and you're aggressive. So I was scared for his life because I didn't know what these police were going to do. They were threatening, like, if you don't, you know, cooperate, we will take you to jail. You know, they even offered to take him in a police car to the hospital. And I'm like, wait, what? The hospital wouldn't even offer him a transfer to another hospital. And I'm like, okay, if you guys decide that you're, you're not going to provide him care, why would you not transfer this, this patient to another hospital? And they failed to do that. And so it just, to me, was really disgusting because I know they wouldn't have done somebody that looked like them like this. You know, Lewis was not no threat. He could not have harmed anybody. And the fact that even on their discharge paperwork, they it, he wasn't discharged because they said he was healthy. They discharged him because they said he violated their, uh, I guess, some type of behavioral contract, which which came out to being that, Lewis that is just... nurses in his room. And he, he told a nurse in particular, I just want to let you know for my safety, I am recording and then that nurse then told the director, and that director said, okay, he's out of here. He, I think they were just frustrated. And anybody that works in healthcare, you are going to be frustrated with patients. Some of these patients are right. dealing with physically, mentally. That's something I had even expressed to this hospital the week prior, and everything was mm -hmm. just kind of left to the wayside. So I just, it was something I had never seen in my life. I was just totally just disgusted by it, honestly. Racial disparity in healthcare well, is a thing. We did return to the hospital. Yeah, we did return to the hospital and uh, have not, uh, of course, gotten a comment from them. Uh, we hate that uh, y'all had to go through this, uh, but we do appreciate uh, you sharing your story with us. Uh, Lacey, thank you so very much. Lewis, thank you so very much. Lewis, I, I, I can't tell. Are you wearing Omega hat on my show? See, there you go. See, I know, I know, see, I know, I, I know the spirit subject. Look at the monitor. I say it is he ran away on my show. Hey, I thought I told you about I that last. I, I appreciate you, man, because you always tend to put a smile on my face. 
<laughs> so I well, appreciate it. Well, always, I, I, we, we, talk, we talk about some serious stuff. And so I, I, always, I say, you know what? I said, I, I always got to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, Lacey, next time, if he wear that purple and gold, go ahead and just snatch that off his head. All right, y'all, y'all take care. We'll be praying for you, Doc. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, keep Thank you. Uh, uh, what happens? Y'all, y'all take care. We surely appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Uh, Thank you. Thank you again, folks. Uh, uh, it's uh, now people need to understand. I, I, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, and one of the reasons why uh, we, we we continually have Lacey and Lewis on here is because I mean, a lot of people need to understand. People watch NFL, they watch sports, they watch college football, uh, but they never see what life is like after that, or what these families deal with uh, in terms of uh, these health issues. Uh, some breaking news uh, just coming in: uh, President Joe Biden is in. Uh, they said they lost my mic. Hey, y'all, do y'all still hear me? Okay, you hear me now. Got it. Uh, again, some breaking news here. President Joe Biden is invoking the Defense Production Act to address the nationwide nationwide shortage of baby baby formula. The part of the problem here is that only four four country four companies essentially dominate baby formula in America. One of the things, though, uh, Monique, uh, that and Democrats have done an awful job with this. Donald Trump actually, by opposing NAFTA and whatever the heck that new thing he called it, he actually made it difficult to be able to import baby formula for Canada from Canada. And so that's actually exacerbated the problem uh, the FDA took um, one of Abbott's uh, manufacturing facilities offline because they had contaminated baby formula. This is what happens in a country when you only have four companies that are dominating a market. If one goes down, you're absolutely screwed. Uh, and so we've seen all of these different stories, Republicans blaming uh, the baby formula problem uh, on President Joe Biden. No, blame it on the companies who screwed up, who were actually sending out uh, a baby formula that was actually making kids sick. Absolutely. Blame it. Blame it on them. Uh, blame it on the prior president because of making it much harder for us to access imports uh, that are necessary. Um, but it also, Roland, I want to point out, it, it, it further highlights the disparities uh, that exist when anything goes wrong. It affects our community disproportionately more so and worse than others. So for instance, there was all this information going around saying, ladies, if you need formula, just go on Amazon, click from your United States um, to Canada and go ahead and order and it will come to your door. And you know what, that worked. That worked for people who have Amazon, have Amazon Prime, people who have Wi-Fi service, people who are not on government assistance, who don't have WIC, or SNAP because you cannot use online purchasing for items for that. So there, there are a lot of issues that people don't necessarily understand who are not dealing with this this part of their lives anymore. I was just, how freaked out I would have been if I had young children um, during a time like this. I was fortunate enough to be able to nurse mine, but then in the transition from nursing to regular milk, being supplementing with some formula in the middle, and it is a, it is there's nothing scarier um, for a mom than not being able to provide pop, proper nourishment uh, for a baby and to hear a crying, hungry baby, and that is something that should never happen in the United States for any child. This is the thing that to me is crazy. Look, I. That's crazy. I, I, I don't understand how, if you are the, the administration, you allow uh, folks to somehow blame you for a problem you have nothing to do with, uh, Scott. Uh, and, and, and this is where you say, no, it's the idiot, all of you idiots who voted for uh, tossing out NAFTA and then approving that, whatever that crap d Trump passed, that's what made it difficult. You put the blame exactly where, that, where it is. And again, the other issue, monopolies in this country, four mm -hmm. companies control 90% of the baby formula in America. 
anything happens with one of those companies, it's a massive crisis in this country. And this is the problem with, with monopolies. You, you're at, here's, here's the other problem, though. Watch this. Under Trump, they let that company, that factory shut down appropriately because of the formula. But they did nothing. The regulators did nothing under these circumstances where 90 percent is covered by those four companies. They did nothing to get that factory back up and running on a timely basis in case we hit this shortage, whether it was during COVID or pre-COVID, it didn't matter. Their administration did that. Had that factory been back up and running on a timely basis, it's, more, it's likely that you wouldn't have this uh, delay or debate. But it's an election year. This is all politics. And so Biden's going to get blamed and he's going to have to respond uh, because he's in the president uh, seat right now. Well, uh, again, uh, th this is what this is uh, smart by the president to invoke uh, this particular uh, uh, National Defense uh, Act because it allows them to import, to bypass that ridiculous law and import baby formula uh, to, in order to actually uh, alleviate this problem, Robert. And, and look, Roland, I, I think this should also highlight the fact that baby formula is exceedingly expensive without uh, government assistance, uh, primarily because of the monopolies that exist. Uh, back when I was in college, I was a security guard at Kroger, right there on, uh, right there by the AUC. So we did the night shift. You know, the number one thing that people stole out of that Kroger, baby formula. Uh, and the, and so what they would do, they would steal large amounts and then resell it because they could resell it for a premium. It was literally like we a day didn't go by that we didn't catch somebody stealing baby formula. Um, a lady ran off. One of the guys I worked with chased after her. I made eight dollars an hour, so I ain't chasing nobody. And she hit him upside the head with one of those big cans of baby formula. So he came back covered in powder. It was hilarious. And uh, but uh, that's beside the point. I think what President uh, Biden needs is a better communications team around him, uh, because what we don't see is him being able to send out surrogates on shows just like this, to hit the late night shows, to hit all the uh, cable news shows, so they can get the administration's a part of the story out there. You still see more uh, pundits and more spokespeople for President Trump than you see for President Biden. So because of that, you don't have anybody carrying the message. And going into November, you have to be able to show the American people that you're putting points on the board, that you're actually doing something to address these problems, that they, when they're solved, they aren't just mysteriously going away, but be, it's because of presidential action. And the ability to show that the uh, deregulation that Republicans have been talking about for the last 30 years, cutting taxes on millionaires and billionaires, result directly in the problems they have right now. And we actually need to have a functional federal government, which is willing to put the measures in place to put competition in the market, keep safe products on the shelf, and then address the failures of the last administration by actually putting in together a competent federal government that can address these issues. All right, folks, uh, let's talk about this story out of your state, Georgia, Robert. Uh, some high schools, some students, they are actually suing uh, their school district for racial discrimination. Five black students at Coosa High School got suspended for wearing Black Lives Matter T-shirts, while white students were allowed to wear Confederate paraphernalia. The black students claimed the school's administration failed to act on reports of racist behavior from white students. The lawsuit is requesting the five-day suspension be deleted from their records and that the school does more to handle racist bullying. Really, Scott? Black Lives Matter is a problem, but Confederate flags is cool. Really? It's, it's, it's a First Amendment issue, first of all. I've never believed it was a political statement. But in these rural counties, in these in Will County and Joliet, Illinois, where I grew up, in these southern counties where... You know, it's not on the national political or economic map. It happens all the time. When I was in high school in, in New Lenox, Illinois, one of the things I had to deal with, which is why I went to Morehouse College, was because once a week, someone would call me the N-word. These were white kids from rural America who were bust in to go to my high school. And while I went through various stages of it, and it was a Catholic high school, they couldn't understand or deal with the racism or my rage in response to it. And it went through several forms and formats. But in the end, many of these kids, they were never really disciplined. They had a conversation that I was called sensitive. I was told to ignore it, blah, blah, blah. All kinds of excuses were made, which simply uh, made no sense. And so it's these rural school districts 
when this is happening, they don't care what the national laws or state laws are. And it sounds like this school, the administrators don't know either. But this is a really interesting lawsuit because if they filed under the Equal Protection Clause or Equal Rights Amendment, then the regs and the activity, uh, the facts of the case, are going to be closely scrutinized uh, by the court to see if there's really evidence of unfair and unequal treatment. Uh, if it is, you've got a constitutional violation, civil rights violation, and this case, whether it, 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 it's local, if you will, and it's against the administrators of the school, it's really going to be about the, the school district, right? And if it gets appealed, this case in and of itself, long way away, could be, uh, could go to the Supreme Court. It'll be interesting to watch if this, if the school, school district doesn't settle. Robert, you there in Georgia? Your thoughts? Uh, I think the school district get, the school district is absolutely going to settle. And I think they're lucky that these parents are only asking for a clean record uh, and uh, for a change in policy yeah. and not for monetary damages. Because, uh, frankly, in cases of this nature, we have multiple plaintiffs. You can probably file a class action against the district and, uh, and frankly, go directly after the county uh, in order to get monetary damages. So I, I agree with Scott that this will probably go up the ladder if it's not settled. But I think the school district understands that right now what they're asking for will be them getting off light. And if they take, uh, if they don't end up settling with the students and doing the, the specific performance that they're requesting, they could end up in a monetary suit, which would be very deleterious to the school district. Monique? They'll change the lawsuit also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the right lawyer will amend it, put in the constitutional violation. Monique, Monique, and, your comment. And then ride it out until it can't go any further, even if they try to settle. It'd be a big case. You done, Scott? <laughs> yeah, I have one other thought, but it's your show, so I'll pass for now. I mean, man, I said, Monique, your thoughts three times. Oh, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. Honest, I didn't. Yeah, I that's the problem. Okay, me. when you keep talking, you can't hear. Well, I'm very insightful. I'm sorry. Uh, M Monique, <laughs> please. Go, go right ahead. Yes. Me. I agree uh, with Robert and with the chatty one, Scott, on this. Um, whatever they do has to be uniform. Uh, carrying around a flag is not the same as wearing paraphernalia that maybe the policy says that they can't wear. I don't know the specifics on what the policy did and did not say. It has to be uniform across the board and hate speech. Um, the, the, the Confederate flag in certain circles can be viewed as a threat in and of itself, as it should be. And I think there's actually case law about that. Scott's the smart one in the family, so he would know. Um, it, it's it's in the fighting word no, language. No, no, no. <laughs> he's not the smart no, one. No, we're in not. The we're not going back to Scott. We're not going back. Okay, no, but I'm, no, he's I, not. I was just. And we're not going I, back to him. Thank you, okay. Referencing him, I don't want to go back to him. But what I do want to plug and say is, your friends from from the NFL, Lacey and Company, they they need a med mal lawyer. I understand what NFL mm -hmm. players go through, but what they're going through right now is um, medical malpractice, and it needs to be handled. Just thought I'd add that. Okay. We'll we'll be happy to afford them your number. All right, y'all. Let's talk <laughs> about um, uh, in Ohio. Yeah, no. Uh, or Rob, one of y'all, one of y'all lawyers can take it. All right, let's talk about Ohio, where some parents are upset that some whites only signs and black only signs were placed on uh, water fountains. School officials say the signs were taken down within 30 seconds. No one saw them. Uh, the principal, Aaron Davis, sent this letter to parents. Earlier today, Coleraine High School administration was made aware of an inappropriate and racist message that was displayed at CHS. The administration is taking this incident very seriously as matters of racial sen insensitivity are not condoned or tolerated. We're currently in the process of investigating this matter. At this time, we have identified two students who were involved. Additionally, we have been made aware that the posting has been shared on social media. Any student, including those who are found to have taken part in sharing the post online, will also be subject to disciplinary action. The actions that were displayed do not reflect the values and culture of Coleraine High School or the, or the Northwest Local School District. CHS stands firm on creating a culture of inclusivity 
Respect, kindness, and compassion. As a school community, it is our responsibility to make sure that our CHS family uphold and live out these values. We will not stand for intolerance of any kind and will discipline any student who participates in displaying intolerant behavior. The three, the three students involved, they were indeed disciplined. All right, then. Well, got it. Now we know exactly how y'all feel about that. All right, y'all, uh, got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk with Marvin Sapp about uh, a new uh, CD he has. Also, our Fit Live Win, uh, excuse me, our um, uh, Tech Talk segment. Uh, it deals with a Get Fit Go app. We'll talk about that as well. So, and then, of course, I'm here uh, in Cedar Hill, uh, Texas, folks, uh, in less than uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to be uh, moderating a town hall with Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett. Uh, we're here at the Community Missionary Baptist Church in Cedar Hill. Uh, she is in a runoff against Jane Hamilton to replace, uh, the, to get the Democratic nomination, to replace Congresswoman Eddie Bridges Johnson, a longtime member of Congress who is retiring from that position. And so we'll be having that town hall after this. Uh, folks, if you're on Facebook and uh, YouTube, be sure to hit that uh, like button. Uh, let's hit 2,000 likes, y'all, on uh, YouTube. It's more than 3,000 of y'all watching. Go ahead and hit that button. Let's make it happen. If y'all also want to support us, please download the Black Star Network app. If you don't want, if you're having issues watching on Facebook or Twitch or Instagram uh, on YouTube, uh, then all you actually have to do, folks, is download the Black Star Network app. Uh, and again, it's available on Apple phone, uh, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, uh, Samsung Smart TV uh, as well. Uh, you can download it again on any of those devices, your iPad, uh, you name it. You see right here. I've got them right here uh, on uh, both of my devices uh, right here. Come back to me, please. Thank you very much. And you will see uh, today's show. Again, you hit that button. You can watch live. Uh, and then, of course, um, it's going to come up in a second. Let me do a full screen. And so you can actually see uh, the show uh, on, your, on your phone uh, right here. Uh, and so another way for you to actually see it. Uh, and so, again, download on any of these. Uh, if you got multiple devices, download them on all different devices. And so uh, there you go right there. Also, of course, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on a minimum of uh, 50 bucks each for the year. That's $4.19 a month. 13 cents a day uh, for them joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, of course, uh, there's no minimum, there's no maximum, and so we appreciate all the support. Cash or money orders, cash, excuse me, checks and money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Why is it so hard to see Panther? What Bruh. deal? Wow. I mean, if you go to Amazon, I think I tried. Man. So I have a collection of. of That's of, a hard of, movie. They charge you three hundred dollars on Amazon. I was like, I'm not about to pay no four hundred dollars yeah. for a VHS cop. Yeah. What's the deal? Man, it is. It is interesting, Roland. It is the movie they don't want you to see. Power to the people. It's funny. I made New Jack City. You can get it anywhere. Posse, you can see it anywhere. But but a movie that says that. It is not an accident that we medicated the black communities right around the time when they were getting militant, when you had the Panthers starting to organize, the people starting to vote and march on Washington. We, we let these communities get med medicated. In fact, that comes up in The Godfather, you know, where they say, as long as it stays in the mm -hmm. black communities. So we asked the question. They tried to say, ask us questions. I asked them, the, the reporters when we did, I said, listen, why is it a 13-year-old boy in the hood can find a, a way to buy a gun, some liquor, or church, or some crack, and yet you can't find them to arrest those people. You can't arrest that deal. Why is that? Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
All right, folks, uh, he is a 13-time Grammy nominee. Uh, he, of course, uh, uh, has released his 15th solo album. It is called Substance, and it is the uh, first uh, one released on his own uh, label. Uh, joining us right now is a uh, gospel singer, preacher, and he also belongs to that little youth group, um, you know, they, they, they wear them little red and white colors. Scott, you should be happy. Uh, I finally invited one of your fellow little Kappa brothers uh, on the show. Because uh, I know, you, see, you got to understand, Marvin, we, we, so many alphas doing great things that nearly every Wednesday is an alpha on here. And Scott feels so lonely. And so we had to go ahead uh, and give him some company today by having you on. So um, may, you may, maybe Scott alphas. is now. I'm shocked that you uh, got him on. <laughs> Go ahead on. No, I don't. I don't only invite alphas. Al alphas simply doing great things. Very few cappers are. So, so Marvin, let's talk about. Uh, 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 let's talent. Give him his just due. Let's do a kappa song. Will you get? Let us do a song for about two, two, uh, nope. two minutes on your show. We're gonna sing a favorite kappa hymn. You see, you, <laughs> the only reason I ain't cussing is because I am broadcasting in a church right now. <laughs> That's oh, the only reason. Bunch of trash. That's the only reason. But let me be real clear. You keep it up. I will go walking out of the parking lot and cuss you out. Don't do it. Don't All do right, it. Barbie, Don't. So tell us about. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We let it. We're gonna let it pass, Marvin. Go on with your interview. Yeah, do your interview. We'll, we'll get him later. <laughs> Roller, you know he I love you. Go ahead and just turn Scott's microphone off. He got to turn Scott's Roller. microphone off because he talking. Come on now. First of all, so first of all, uh, you ain't far from where I am. So are you are you in Fort Worth now, or you are somewhere else around the country? Well, actually, I'm home. I don't live in Fort Worth. I just passed it there, but I I stay in the DFW Metroplex, and and I love it, man. This is like. One of the greatest decisions I could have ever made in this season of my life was to uh, move from Grand Rapids to to Texas. And, and so, how long have you how long have you been pastoring uh, here in Fort Worth? Because I remember we talked and you talked about how difficult that decision was uh, to leave Grand Rapids, the school you had there, uh, yeah. to transition uh, to uh, Fort Party Worth to pastor. Well, I mean, it, let's see, it's, uh, it'll be three years in August. It'd be three years in August. When I first moved, uh, which was, was a trip, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I, a lot of people thought I left, you know, to come to a mega church, and, and I didn't. I moved down here to pastor a church uh, of approximately 250 people, and um, the church grew in six months from 250 to over 1,300 active, and then COVID hit. And, um, you know, but, you know, we transitioned, we shifted, and uh, made sure that we were able to be you know, seen globally via all of our social media platforms and streaming and and we grew in spite of. So, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm thankful to be here. I'm chilling at my crib and um, just enjoying this 90 plus degree weather. <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm happy to be home uh, with uh, 90 degree weather. I got sick and tired of those 50s and 60s in D.C. Uh, but, but I do want to pick up on that point that, that, that you just made because um, uh, because, again, you said you left to pastor a church of 250 people. You know, we're living in an age where I guarantee you somebody's watching going, what was he thinking? I mean, why is he not, why is he not leading a church with four, four or five or six or 10,000 members? Uh, t take us through that decision because, uh, so, again, the, the, the average person would go, well, someone of his stature I mean, that's just, that's, that's beneath him. No, absolutely not. I mean, if, if you do a statistical study, you will find that, you know, the majority of the churches in the country are only 75 members. I mean, so, yeah. you know, and, and not only that, but, you know, uh, less than 1% of churches are over 1,000. Um, so, you know, just having the opportunity to, um, I don't know what just happened, but just having the opportunity to come down here and so, to start. Somebody watch, somebody watching you on the show decided to Skype you. Oh, no, well, I, it I probably don't know was Jamal Bryant. It, it, yeah. That was Monique. <laughs> that no, was but, Monique. But, 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 but uh, you know, I, 
I needed a change. You know, I had a great church in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I always tell people that mega churches are actually their relative, depends on where you stay. And being in Grand Rapids, Michigan, have a church, having a church there that had an active membership of over 500. You know, we owned a college campus there where our charter school was and did all of the things that we were able to do and we're absolutely debt free. You know, that was a great situation. But you never know how bad you need change until you get there. And with all of the things that have transpired in my life, and with my kids being grown, you know, I just really began to pray and really talk to God about shifting and changing and, and moving someplace to start over fresh. And uh, I had plenty of opportunities. Um, once I made the decision to shift, I don't know, it was like, you know, God just opened up the floodgates and there were a multiplicity of churches that gave me calls wanting me to come and to move. And uh, I just decided to come to Funky Town. So, you know, it's, it has worked for me. Um, I love it here. My kids love it here. Uh, as a matter of fact, my son just moved here maybe about three months ago. He worked at Amazon <laughs> Services. So, I mean, like, it's a great church. It's grown, uh, and, and we're doing some great things in, in our community. Uh, let's talk about your new album. You, you, uh, you open your own label. Yeah. Um, talk about that as opposed to signing with someone else. Uh, what is it like? owning, completely controlling your content as opposed to asking someone else for permission? Well, I mean, that's everything. I mean, for 33 years, I've been in this industry. And honestly, for 33 years, I've been on a major label. I started off uh, with the company Word Epic and then ended up signing with Verity, which was a division of Sony, and then RCA. So my whole entire career has been nothing but um, being controlled. And I just said to myself, after 33 years of being in this industry and having a, a, a great base, you know, uh, it was kind of easy for me to make that shift and that transition to wanting to be my own boss and, and controlling uh, my own personal destiny simply because of, you know, I got a, I got a good audience. So I just believe that they're going to follow me wherever I go as long as I keep doing what is consistent musically. And uh, that's the way I try to keep it. I try to keep it churchy and funky all at the same time. So, you know, being on this side, though, is absolutely different because there were when, when I was so accustomed to going into the studio, doing a record, turning it in, having them put together a stylist and doing all of those different things. It was easy, to be honest with you. On this side where you control everything, you have to deal with manufacturers. You have to talk to uh, the different companies as it pertains to walmart and talking to uh all of the different distributors of music if they're doing a physical copy and or if they're doing digital you know so it's it's a whole nother world um having to make sure you calculate royalty rates and things of that nature so you know how to pay people um uh, but honestly it's been fun because i'd rather be on this side uh and be my own boss and cut out the middleman than to uh be on the other side where, you know, I was probably one of the last ones to be paid. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I can't hear you now. Something just happened. I can't hear you, Rome. There you go. All right. Not sure what's going on. We got demons up in here. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> there you go. We can hear you now. All right. Let's go. That's, the, that's those Kappa demons. All right. Uh, Monique, <laughs> you get to ask the first question. Not you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a question. Pastor Sapp, thank you so much. Thank you for everything. God bless you, sir. God bless your life. Thank you for everything that you have meant to the gospel community, to this world. Um, you've been a blessing in my life and the life of so many others, and I'm just thankful for all of your latest accomplishments. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do. Thank you so much. Robert. What will be your advice for 
<laughs> uh, what would be your advice for young pastors who are currently entering the the ministry? There's a lot of conflicting uh, information out there, a lot of being pulled in a lot of different directions. Uh, I've spoken at a seminary school recently to students about um, activism and uh, organizing. A lot of them say, well, I want to have a big house. They want to have a mega church. They want to be a celebrity. What, what would be your advice to, uh, to getting started? What should actually drive you into the ministry as opposed to some of the pulling towards fame and fortune that many people are uh, focused on now? What, what's so amazing to me is, is that they think that being a pastor is a fame and fortune type of situation. I mean, you know, once you get into it, you will understand that, you know, it's a life filled with service. And, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a five, 10,000 member church, because the reality is, is that the majority of the churches in America ain't five, 10,000 members. Uh, you know, that's it, it. That's just it's a fallacy. So I would just really kind of challenge them and tell them that if you're serious about ministry and if you're serious about serving people, because that's what this is really all about. Um, this is a, a, a thankless job, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but it's also a rewarding job when you get the opportunity to see people's lives change and uh, you motivate them and encourage them to be better. Um, that's, that's the reason why I got into ministry, because I understood that this was my life's assignment. It wasn't because uh, I was looking for fame and or fortune. I, I, I got into it because I really wanted to see people's lives change um, through the word of God. And, and I've seen it. So so that's to me is is what it's really all about. All right, Marvin. Well, uh, we appreciate it. All right, I guess I go. Ahead whoa, go ahead. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I got a question. No way. No way. <laughs> oh no way! And you're in church. Come on, Scott, hurry up! <laughs> hurry up! Okay, hurry up! Okay, this is going to be good. I want to talk to uh, Pastor Sap about another part of his life that you wouldn't even imagine how I met him for the first time. Uh, three or four years ago, I was managing partner of Reed Smith, and Pastor Sap and some colleagues of him came to the D.C. office, invited by Keon Pope, a former partner of mine, to talk for Black History Week program. And he broadcast to probably 29 offices worldwide. We had about 100, 150 people there. Do you remember, Pastor? I do. And At the I law firm the... of Reed Smith? It was fun. Now, now he don't remember. Yes, he does. Can I just get my question out? And so it, he talked about his life. Well, if you hurry up and ask the question, love of music. I mean, you gave us that long, that long, that long meet and greet? Come on. Can I just finish? He, it, it, was a, it was a very powerful interview to people that you didn't think he would normally understand or appreciate his gospel music. But every, everybody, black, white, yellow, and brown was there. And so I want to thank you for that. And I want to also ask you, how often do you do that? Because it doesn't matter what music and what your calling is. I thought your interview was just super powerful about life, as well as how you develop your music and your calling from God. Well, I mean, you know, I, I do it often because, I mean, I just think that if you just keep it 100 and you be real about what you do and who you are and be as translucent as possible, I struggle with transparency because I just mm -hmm. don't think you see everything about your life. Um, but you need to be selective and, and discreet about what you show people and, and what you share. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I get the opportunity to share my life with a lot of people. As a matter of fact, uh, on the 21st of August, uh, we just finished filming, and it will be out on uh, TV One. Uh, the Never Would Have Made It story, uh, Never Would Have mm. Made It that you know uh, biopic. So this has given me an opportunity to be able to share aspects of my life and allow people to see things that you know most people don't know. They just know Never Would Have Made It. They know the preacher and singer, but they don't know the gay yeah. man mess. So I'm I'm really excited about having the opportunity to really share some things about my life with people so that they can see that no matter where you come from, no matter how bad things might have been in the beginning, that you still have the opportunity to yeah. shift, change, and, and make things better and make something better out of your life. Yeah, I certainly look forward to seeing it. Thank you, Roland. Ro, listen, the album is available yeah, right up? now. It's available right now. You can all pre-order it. It actually comes out on June the 10th. It comes out on June the 10th, but you can... Uh, 
pre-order it on any and or every one of your media platforms. You can go to my website if you want physical copy, because I do still understand that everybody is not, you know, tech savvy. There's a whole lot of people that still want the CD so they can read the credits and stuff. Uh, but you can go to Amazon, any place that you get your music. I promise you it's going to be a great blessing to you. Substance is going to be hot. Well, 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 also, what some folks don't know is that when they download music, they don't realize they don't actually own the music. You're actually you licensing the music. Uh, the, those of us who grew up, well, you know, we have relatives who pass down albums. You actually can't pass down digital music uh, without that username and password. And so the physical copy is still uh, is still worthy. So, yeah, I, I understand that. And Scott, you had no idea what I just said. Trust me. So you probably one of the physical copy people. All right, uh, Marvin Sapp, <laughs> always glad to see you. Uh, again, uh, one of the uh, two or three Kappas I tolerate in my life, along with Jamal Bryant. Oh, you, uh, you, like you, know you, you, you like me. You know you like us. You like us. You like us. We family. We brothers. You well, know, look, you know we no, brothers. I, you know, look, look, y'all all need an alpha around y'all to hold y'all up, to lift y'all up, and to lay hands on y'all when y'all get extra. <laughs> so well, y'all be sure to get... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Y'all be sure to get uh, Pastor Sam, uh his uh, g get his new CD. And if y'all are in Fort Worth, uh, give folks the name of the church so they can stop by and leave their tithe and offering when they come by. Well, just come by first. Chosen Vessel Church in the city of Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> All they got to do is just Google my name and the church will come up. I promise you. You have a great time. You can watch me every Sunday, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time on any and all of our social media platforms. Now, Scott need to send you an offering. Scott, I'm, oh. Scott I'm, I think you should send your Kappa brother a $5,000 offering uh, uh, for, for a program at the church. Uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead and call it out. So, uh, so uh, uh, Pastor Sapp, be sure to let me know uh, when uh, Scott's uh, uh, direct deposit went through. Let me know when we'll it happened. We'll Cause see, because if you were Alpha, my money I, tight. if you were Alpha, I, I would have done that. My money is tight. <laughs> oh, now you no longer his Kappa brother. I, see how y'all are? You know, All right, Pastor Sapp, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. In the Bible. I love y'all, man. Take it easy. Lawyers, or was that the tax collector? The tax collector, <laughs> Jesus, spoke, spoke ill of, didn't it? <laughs> Scott, Scott, you ain't read your Bible in about 25 years. <laughs> yeah, but I know that. Here. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> I know that. I talked to you later, Folks, man. I got to go to a real, a real, uh, yes, sir, I appreciate it. Real quick break. We come back to Tech Talk for our final segment on Roland Martin Unfiltered. The Black Star Network, broadcasting live from CDO. Owens, America's Wealth Coach and host of Get Wealthy. Let me hit you with a few numbers. African Americans spend nine times the amount on ethnic beauty products and yet only own 1% of the beauty supply stores. It's an $18 billion industry. On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to learn and hear from a woman who's turning this obstacle into an opportunity. We literally take you from A to Z on all of the things step by step you need to have in place to open and run a very successful beauty supply store. That's right here with me, Deborah Owens, host of Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Got it. All right, a lot of people are intimidated uh, by fitness apps, things along those lines. They see the hard bodies and all this sort of stuff along those lines. So my next guest actually created this app called Ready, Get, Fit, Go. Uh, it is targeting uh, folks uh, who are plus size and also 
fitness newbies. Uh, Chamara Bentley experienced her own health transformation uh, and wrote a book called How to Lose Weight Fast When You Lack Motivation. She joins us now from Cleveland, Ohio. Chamara, glad to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, what, what was the issue for you? And so uh, was it was it you just didn't want to do it? Um, and, and then what you and then and what what spurred you to get going? Well, I started off at 403 pounds and I was just at a really low point in my life. And I was so sick and tired of feeling how I was feeling. And I knew I needed to make a change. So it's just like one day I said enough's enough. And I just, I got up and I just tried was doing some workouts. Um, I did discover that because I was overweight, my body wasn't able to physically do this, the kind of moves that I was trying to do. So that's when, you know, I started just like making mm -hmm. my own workouts and that's where I just started. So on your app, you focus on low intensity workouts. Again, a lot of people, they jump right into it, but they really aren't physically able to do so. Uh, and so it's because of what you experienced, is that how you tailored your app? Yes, yes. Basically, you know, I wanted to just make workouts for people who were like me. And um, I just wanted like all my workouts are just for beginners. And so it just I wanted it to be easy so people wouldn't become discouraged and they, too, can be getting self-love slash weight loss journey as well. Uh, well, if this was a second about guns, Robert Patillo would be excited. Uh, so I know uh, he appreciates hearing about these low-intensity workouts. Robert, you get the first question. I do have, uh, have a question. So we, we've heard a lot in the media, particularly uh, recently, about body positivity uh, and kind of this campaign against fat shaming. Uh, how do you uh, how do you kind of balance that and also convincing people that it is good and positive to, to start working out and losing weight and getting in shape for their own personal health? Well, you know, it's it's okay to want to be healthy. You know, I mean, obviously, I've lost a hundred and 16 pounds and I'm still plus size, but I wanted to just be a healthier version of myself. And I just want to encourage, you know, just being healthy and happy, you know, the goal isn't to be skinny, just, you know, healthy. So I, I still love who I am. I still love my thickness. I love, you know, everything that I do. I just want to be healthy. All right, uh, Monique, question. Sure. Um, where where can can people get started? You know, if they are stuck in a rut and are basically emotionally exhausted and not able to find the motivation to do anything at all, what do you suggest? I definitely you have to. So I, it's a weight loss journey, but it's also a self. -love. So you definitely have to start with like putting yourself first and you have to change your mindset. And it's not something, this is a lifestyle change. So it's not something that's going to, you know, just happen overnight. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to just, you know, make the in initiative to make a change and you have to, you know, start off slow so you don't become overwhelmed. I feel like that's where a lot of people end up, you know, kind of not succeeding or wanting to give up because they, they're so overwhelmed with just wanting to just make a big old change. You know, you just start with a small goal and, you know, we have a big goal. We see the bigger picture, but break it down a bit and make it a small goal. So it, eventually you will get to your bigger goal. So if you say you want to lose 100 pounds, that's great. But maybe bring it back and just say, OK, for the first month, I want to lose 10 pounds and I want to lower my carb intake and I want to increase my protein, drink more water, and then you'll you'll get to that bigger goal. But just, you don't want to overwhelm yourself. So you just start with just changing your mindset and just, you know, you just got to put yourself first. Scott Bolden. Yeah, uh, thank you for being on the show and congratulations on your weight loss. Uh, but there's an emotional and psychological side to weight loss as well. And can you talk a little bit about that, not just from a body image standpoint, but psychological dependence on food, how you interact with food, why you overeat, not you, but you generally overeat, and really, what's that battle like 
notwithstanding the workouts and, and the app? It's, it's, it's hard. That's why I call it a self-love journey because you do have to work on things mentally. So it's really important to journal. Um, everything's not going to work for every person, but you should start off with writing down your emotions because a lot of people emotionally eat. And um, so definitely, you know, just um, like I said, journaling and just telling, like looking in the mirror and just telling yourself positive affirmations and you, you have to do the work. So it's a self-love journey as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard when, you know, we all get cravings for certain foods, but that's what I talk about when it comes to setting small goals. So you can say for the next three days, I'm going to, you know, eat this this so you know you can kind of not become overwhelmed and fall back into your old habits you know you you be, become more proud of yourself and just stay encouraged and it's like a mindset so definitely just taking things slow and just writing things down is um, a big part of it because it's it, it is mental with any change not just weight loss so Thank all you. right, the app is ready. Get fit, go. Uh, I think it's on all available platforms. Uh, Jamara uh, Bryant, we certainly uh, appreciate uh, you joining us on the show, uh, and good luck with the app. Thank you so much. All right, thanks so much. Take care. All right, Scott, Monique, Robert, I certainly appreciate y'all joining.